Welcome to the Stranger Than Fiction podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Patrick Meekin. I would like to remind you to please subscribe, like, and share if you like the content we are producing. You can also support the podcast by picking up a copy of Nightmare in Holmes County or 225th Street at Amazon.com. Both books tell terrifying true stories of spiritual warfare and paranormal activity in real-life haunted houses and are available as Kindle, audiobook, or paperback at Amazon. Tonight we will be taking another look at the botched exorcism of Emily Rose. The title of the program is The Truth Behind the Exorcism of Emily Rose, and we will be taking a deep look at the details of the botched exorcism that led to the death of Annalise McKell who is also known as Emily Rose in the Hollywood movie from 2005. Thank you for tuning in, and let's get started with part two. Welcome back from the break. In the second half of the show, we are going to get into dissecting the truth behind the exorcism of Emily Rose, and we are going to compare and contrast the methods of exorcism used by the Catholic priests and the biblical model for exorcism. Now, I stated earlier that Annalise McKell had gone to the Catholic Church repeatedly for years seeking exorcism, and they refused. And they basically had told her that what she needed was to just try to live a more religious life, try to just be godlier. And that was the answer they gave her. But it did not help. She was unable to do this. It did not rid her of the torment that she was going through. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because I think all too often in the Protestant church, this is the exact same thing that happens. Someone goes to their preacher and they state to them that, you know, something is going on where they're being demonized or something to that effect. And little or no help is offered most of the time. Usually what is offered is, Hey, we got this new program. That's really cool. You know, if you're single, we got a singles group you can get involved in and make some new friends. Or maybe we have a young married couples class that you can get involved in, or we have a new small group Bible study and you can get involved in, and that's what you really need. And you know, None of those things are going to help a person get rid of demons. It does not work like that. What gets rid of demons is taking authority in Jesus' name and driving them out. And yeah, sometimes that's a fight. Sometimes we wrestle with those spirits before they leave. They don't just come out because we instantly say, uh, come out in Jesus' name and they flee immediately. That could happen depending on what kind of spirit it is and why it's there. But often what happens is they put up a fight because they are very powerful entities. And we are only fighting in Jesus' name. We're just flesh and blood fighting in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the most powerful name ever known anywhere. But we are flesh. We are people. And he gave us that authority. So the demons are going to try to resist most of the time. But guess what? That's why we re- the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That means that, you know what? Sometimes it's a knockdown, drag out fight, but guess who's getting knocked down and drug out? Not the Christian if they keep fighting. If they don't keep fighting or if they're not really a Christian, yeah, they're going to get knocked down and drug out. As in the Bible, it says the seven sons of Sceva, who were exorcists, and they attempted to cast a demon, a, a demon out of a man. And they said, uh, they addressed this demon in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, the apostle Paul. And when they did that, they didn't know Jesus. They just knew that Jesus was the name that Paul used to drive out demons. They didn't know him personally. And when they did this, that's a very dangerous game. When they did it, the demon said to them, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And the demon leaped on the men, seven of them beat the tar out of them and drove them out wounded and naked, fleeing, 
One demon possessed man did that to seven. <laughs> so that's what happens. That's why you, when, when you try to take authority without being a born again Christian, because that authority is in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, as these two priests began this process of exorcism on Annalise McKell, it began in the fall of 1975. They conducted approximately 67 exorcism sessions, one to two per week, oftentimes lasting as long as four hours each. During these exorcisms, Annalise spoke in multiple foreign languages, which she did not know. For example, they spoke in Hebrew, Latin, Greek, German, Assyrian, neo aramaic and English. Furthermore, the one priest had been a missionary in China, and he could speak Chinese. He addressed the spirits in Chinese, and they answered him. They understood Chinese, although Annalise did not. They addressed the spirits in Dutch, although Annalise did not know how to speak Dutch. The demons did. The demons told the priests, we can speak any language you want. When the priest would try to speak without reading, he would just try to loosely speak Greek or Latin without really knowing it, without reading it out of a book. The demon would correct him. When he made mistakes, the demon would correct him. Annalise knew none of those things. She did not know those languages. Also, during these multiple exorcism sessions, at least six demon spirits were identified. Here's how they identified themselves. In Hebrew, they said, we are the ones who dwell within. I am the one who dwelt within Cain, said one spirit in Hebrew. Another said, I am the one who dwelt within Nero. He spoke that in Latin. Another said, I once dwelt within Judas. That was spoken in in Greek. Another declared, I was with Legion. That was spoken in German. Another declared, I am Belial. He said that in an Assyrian Neo-Aramaic language. A lot of these are clear, direct references to scriptures. Evil things that happened or evil people in the scriptures and who obviously did have demons controlling them. Finally, another spirit said, I am Lucifer, the devil in the flesh. That was spoken in English. The sixth spirit claimed to be a spirit that had been in a fallen priest fleshman. Now, between the 67 sessions, Annalise could flip back and forth between normal, sweet, caring, religious Annalise and these demon spirits fully manifested. One minute she could be Annalise, the next minute she could be Lucifer or the spirit that was in Judas or these other various spirits. But she would attempt to have normalcy in her life during this time between these exorcism sessions. Now, during the exorcisms, Annalise demonstrated superhuman strength. She attacked the priests. She often had to be restrained by multiple people or chained down. Between the sessions, she was said to have ran around the house like a billy goat. She had barked like a dog. She would then enter into periods of becoming somewhat comatose, where she was very rigid, seemed to not even be conscious. Um, at, at times, she would become so heavy that people couldn't even carry her. She then ruptured both kneecaps from 
engaging in over 600 genuflections, meaning she would drop to her knees. She'd be standing upright and then instantly drop to her knees and then stand upright and then drop to her knees over and over and over. And she ruptured both of her kneecaps. Now, there were times where she would appear to become so normal that she would even begin working on her thesis for her schooling, but then would again revert back to this demonic behavior where the demons would take over her body. As the exorcisms progressed, the spirit that went by the name Lucifer revealed a secret that should have been capitalized on, but was not. Lucifer said that the reason Annalise was possessed was because she was cursed from the beginning. That's a quote. And that she was cursed before birth. That speaks of a generational curse. That could have been dealt with. Annalise then began claiming that she could sense the presence of the Virgin Mary, saints, and dead relatives during the exorcisms. She then began stating that the Virgin Mary was communicating with her and gave her messages for the priests. She then wrote in her diary that Jesus spoke to her and told her that she had to suffer and had to do penance, but her sufferings and sins and desperation would help Jesus save souls. Then later, Annalise said that the Virgin Mary had once again spoken to her and told her that she had a choice. She could either have instant deliverance from the demons or she could keep the demons and keep suffering, but that many would be saved because of her because through her being possessed, many would see that the devil is for real. There really are demons. And then the Virgin Mary told Annalise allegedly, that she would be delivered of the demons before death and she would die in God's grace. Well, sadly, Annalise never did find the deliverance from demons that she so desperately sought. On July 1st, 1976, at approximately 8 o'clock in the morning, Annalise passed away at 23 years old. At the time of death, she weighed only 68 pounds. She was unable to eat and drank very little. And she said that she would have eaten, but the demons wouldn't let her. Her cause of death was starvation and dehydration. There was an autopsy performed, which included a microscopic study of Annalise's brain, which showed there was no cause for the seizures. She was not suffering from grand mal epilepsy as she had been diagnosed. That is why the anti-epileptic drugs did nothing. Later, Annalise's parents and the two priests were charged, tried, and convicted of negligent homicide. They were sentenced to six months in jail, which they never had to serve. In the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, it was kind of told from the standpoint that this priest who had dedicated his whole life to serving Jesus Christ had done everything in his power to save Annalise's life, or in that case, Emily Rose's life, to no avail, and then was wrongfully put on trial. But I would like to take a little better look at the truth behind the scenes and look at what really happened. As I stated earlier, 67 times these priests met with Annalise for the purpose of casting out her demons. As I stated earlier, at least six demons identified themselves. As I stated earlier, one of the spirits claimed that she was possessed 
because she had been cursed before birth. So why weren't the demons driven out? Why didn't they leave? I believe the answer to that question lies in the transcripts of the taped exorcisms. As I read over these transcripts and as I listened to other of the audio tapes of the exorcisms, I had trouble even calling these sessions exorcisms at all. They made the problem much worse than it already was. I mentioned that Annalise had supposedly seen a vision of the Virgin Mary who told her that she was special and had been chosen to atone for souls in purgatory, but she would have to suffer. And Annalise because she believed she was chosen by God for that, agreed to it. I personally believe that alone would have opened her up to demon possession. Because, number one, all of this activity with the Virgin Mary appearing to people, it is not the Virgin Mary, it is a demon. The spirit that is passing itself off as the Virgin Mary, I believe, and I have confirmed during exorcisms that I have performed, that that is a Jezebel spirit. Any spirit that wants to put itself over men and in the authority role in the church and elevated above Jesus Christ is Jezebel. And that is exactly what is going on with this Virgin Mary phenomenon. Furthermore, as I stated on previous broadcasts, the Virgin Mary, after giving birth to Jesus, ceased being a virgin when she, quote, knew, unquote, her husband Joseph, and she then bore other children to Joseph. So this Virgin Mary that they're praying to is not even the Mary who gave birth to Jesus. Even if it was, that's necromancy. We are not to pray to dead people. Now I pointed out also that as these exorcisms progressed, Emily sensed the presence of the Virgin Mary and dead saints and dead relatives during the exorcisms. And she thought they were there to help her. As I stated also, Emily believed that the Virgin Mary also spoke to her and told her that if she chose to keep the demons to, so she could help save other souls that she would be delivered before she died and she would die in God's grace. There is no indication whatsoever that Emily was ever, or Annalise was ever delivered of these demon spirits. Furthermore, during the exorcisms, looking at the transcripts, the demons repeatedly said, we are not leaving. We're never leaving. We are not leaving. Now, I've had demons tell me that before, too. But guess what? They left. And not because I told them to. They did it because I told them to in the authority of Jesus Christ's name. That is where the authority is. It's not in me saying it. It's in anyone who is a born-again Christian. For real, you have authority over unclean spirits. As long as that person doesn't want the demons, if they really, truly don't want them, They're going to have to leave. So as I look down through this transcript of the sessions or some of the sessions, there were huge red flags as I looked at the dialogue between these priests and the demons. Now, number one. A lot of people that really don't do deliverance, but they want you to think they do because they want the title of exorcist or demonologist or whatever. They always say that, oh, if you just tell that demon to leave in Jesus' name and it instantly leaves. I've had deliverance ministers, quote unquote deliverance ministers tell me that. You tell them to leave in Jesus' name, they leave instantly. And you should never have a dialogue with a demon. You should never talk to a demon. You should never ask a demon its name. On and on and on and on. 
And I, here, here's the deal. You go back and you look at the Bible. What does the Bible say? I don't care what this deliverance minister says. I don't care what the Catholic priests say. What does the Bible say? You know what? I can find instances in the Bible where not only were demons called by their name. And if we didn't need to know their name, it wouldn't be recorded in scripture. But not only were they called by name, Jesus asked what their name was. Jesus also asked a boy who was demon possessed by a deaf and dumb spirit. Jesus asked the boy's father how long ago it had been since that demon came into the child. So there is some dialogue. There is some things that we need to know to be successful at deliverance ministry or exorcism. Because Jesus already knew the answers to those questions. He knew that his disciples needed to watch those things. The people in the future, you know, the people on earth right now who really believe in deliverance, we're going to need to be able to reference those scriptures and know what to do. That's why Jesus asked Legion his name. That's why he did it. Jesus already knew. Jesus knew the name of every single demon in that individual. But he asked because he was demonstrating to us what we are going to need to do when we do deliverance. Many demons were named in the Bible when they were cast out. Now, I believe the reason why Jesus asked the boy, the boy's father, when the demon had come into the boy, I think that had to do with getting to the bottom of why it's there. And that was for our benefit as well. But when I look at the dialogue of the priest's, with these demons, it goes way off track and it is very little in any way at any time on track. Now I've known people who did cast out demons and they simply, the demon came up, they ex- exercised their authority in Jesus name over it and cast it out. Oftentimes when you don't get to the bottom of why that demon was there in the first place and who it was, Number one, the person probably has other demons that are still there hiding. I've seen that repeatedly. Number two, whatever opened that person up to that demon, if it has not been dealt with, there's still an open door. And Jesus said himself, that demon can go back at some time. And if that person still has an open door there, you know, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's an open door that's never been dealt with. That demon's going back in. And when he goes back in, he's going to take seven demons more evil than himself. And the latter end of that man that gets repossessed, the latter end is worse than it was in the first place. That's why I believe it is important to get to the bottom of why they're there. So what you need to know is who are they? What legal right do they have to be there? And then you deal with that and you drive them out in Jesus name. It's that simple. Now, major problems in the way these priests went about exorcism. And I'm going to say it, and this is going to be controversial, but, you know, if you've listened to my program at all, or if you listen to Paul and Linda, you know what? We don't really care about being controversial or ruffling feathers. We're going to just tell it to you straight. We're going to tell you the truth. Okay. Number one. They really didn't try too hard to cast the demons out of the girl. They really didn't. If you look at the dialogue, it is so convoluted and arrogant and it's, it's so far off track. It's no wonder the demons didn't listen. Number two, the Bible is very clear where the authority comes from to cast out demons. And it's not in any other name than the name of Jesus Christ. And to prove that, let's look at some scripture. You know, people who have a problem with my message, people who have a problem with 225th Street, the problem isn't really me. It's Jesus Christ that they have a problem with. And Jesus said, they will hate you because they hated me first. The world is not going to love you if you're following Christ and you're given the real message of Christ. The world's not going to love you. They're going to hate your guts. And you know what? The people that hate what I'm saying, they hate the message I'm sharing. They hate the fact that I talk about casting out demons and I wrote a book about it and I'm working on another book and then another book. 
their problem isn't with me, it's with Jesus. Because a servant is not greater than his master. That's what Jesus said. He said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they hated me, they will hate you also. So if you have a problem with this message, you need to step back and take a look at who you really have the problem with, and you need to repent. Let's look at the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 17. Now this is after Jesus had sent out disciples, giving them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. And it says, beginning at verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In other words, Jesus said, hey, I gave you authority over all the spirits, all the powers of the enemy. All these demon spirits, yeah, they are subject to you. But rejoice more in that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice more, not so much in that the demons are subject to you, but that your names are written in heaven. That means you're going to heaven. That means you're saved. That's how you get that authority. So right there, it was very clear, though, that power and that authority is in one name. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if that was the only place that said that in the Bible, that would be more than enough. But it's not. So I'm going to show another example. And that is in the Great Commission, as given in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 17. Now, this is Jesus giving the Great Commission. And he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Going on to verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So right there again, what's it say in verse 17? To them that believe in, in Jesus Christ, those who are saved, in his name shall they cast out devils. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, as I went through these transcripts of these exorcisms between these priests and the demons and Annalise McKell, over and over and over, the priests, would command the demon to give him pieces of information and tell him things, tell him secrets, and he would command it in the name of Mary. Sometimes in the name of the Virgin Mary, sometimes in the name of Mary, sometimes in the name of the Trinity, most often in the name of Jesus and Mary. I command you in the name of Jesus and Mary. Tell me this, tell me that. And as you go down through the list, this priest is not simply finding out why are you there, who are you, and why are you there to make him leave, because he got that information. The problem was he didn't have any authority, because you know what? He was not looking to Jesus to forgive his sins. He was looking to Mary to do it. And if you think that's crazy, go read the transcripts. Repeatedly, this priest talks to the demons about how Mary's saving all these souls, how Mary is doing it. Wrong. Mary's not saving anybody. You know, Mary was a godly woman who was chosen to give birth to the Son of God. But guess what? Mary is a person. Mary is not deity. There is no authority in the name of Mary. This priest repeatedly, the conversations would just go on and on and on with these demons, um, just talking about trying to get the demons to affirm the Catholic doctrine and different points of Catholicism. And you could see it a mile away. The demons were playing this guy. They were playing him like a fiddle. And why were they playing him like a fiddle? 
because they were not allowing Annalise to eat or drink enough water to sustain, sustain life. They knew if they drug it out long enough, she's dead. And the priest would ask questions like, how long are you going to stay? How long will it be before you leave? And a demon would say, Sometimes it would say, I'm never leaving. Other times it would say, 20 years. You know, and, and then he would throw holy water and the demons would make fun of it. They made, you know, they would make fun of the rosary. And then he, when he would say, no, the queen of the rosary uh, compels you or, or whatever, so things to that effect. The demon would humor him. The demon was simply humoring this guy. There is no authority in Mary's name. And if you think I'm wrong... Explain to me why they didn't leave. They didn't leave because he didn't have the authority to be evoking the name of Jesus in the first place. The other thing is his Jesus is not the same Jesus in the Bible, the true Bible. It's a, it's a false Christ. The Bible speaks of false Christs. That's what he's, these priests are worshiping. I'm not knocking all the good Catholic people. I'm knocking the religion because it's wrong. You don't ever worship Mary. You don't... It, ever ask Mary to atone for your sins. Jesus did it once and for all. And this idea of Mary, this Virgin Mary appearing and asking this young girl to atone for people's sins, that's demonic. Now, if you're not offended yet, and or if you think that I'm off my rocker, let me continue because I'm going to point out more discrepancies in these accounts of the Virgin Mary. Number one, Mary told Annalise that she would be delivered of the demons before she died. Didn't happen. It did not happen. Number two, obviously, this spirit that was speaking to Annalise was lying to her repeatedly by pretending that Jesus needed someone else to atone for sins or that anyone needed to make penance beyond their repentance beyond confessing and forsaking their sin to Jesus. But as if that wasn't enough in 1978, two years after Annalise's death, while the trial was going on, the parents and the priests were being tried for negligent homicide. A nun says that the Virgin Mary appeared to her and told her to have them dig up Annalise's body and open the casket because Annalise was really an angel and her body will not have been decayed in any way. And that'll be proof that, that the priest is was telling the truth and he should be acquitted. So guess what? Annalise's parents had the body dug up. They said that they wanted to give Annalise a nicer coffin. So they dug up the body, they opened the casket, and Annalise's body was in a state of decay, exactly how any other's body would be after two years. So again, these spirits lied over and over and over. Here's the amazing part. During these dialogues between the priests and the demons, not only were they evoking the name of Mary and acting like there's authority in that, not only was the demon making fun of them constantly, never did listen to anything they told it to do. It totally played them like a fiddle. It would even tell them repeatedly that it lied constantly, that it always lied, that the demon lied all the time. It would tell them that. And then they would say something to the effect of, but is the Catholic religion the only true religion and the Protestants are wrong? Something to that effect, okay? Because that's what they were always trying to get at. Get the demons to tell them this. And the demon would say, yes. Yes, the Protestants are wrong. Or something to that effect. Over and over and over. After the demons telling them it lies constantly, they're still asking it to affirm their religion. Why would you ask a liar to affirm that to you? And they had no authority to drive it out. They could not drive it out. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. I'm going to tell you that they should have been prosecuted. Not only did they teach a religion that was full of heresy and totally scoffed at Jesus' sacrifice, but then they are also ignoring Jesus' own words while they're leading 
sheep to the slaughter. Well, they're supposedly leading people in the ways of God. They're trying to cast out demons in the name of Mary, carrying on crazy dialogue with these demon spirits and not driving them out of the young lady who desperately needed her deliverance so her life could be spared. At one point, not only did the demons tell them repeatedly that they lied constantly, and they continued with this dialogue and trying to constantly affirm that Mary saved souls and that Mary was the final authority, which is that is what the dialogue was saying over and over and over. The demon starts laughing at the priest. And the demon says, I'm the one who made her write all that stuff. And the priest's like, what stuff? And he said, I'm the one who made her write all that stuff. And what he was referring to was all those false visions that she wrote about in her diary where the Virgin Mary told her that if she kept the demons, she would be delivered before she died. She would be delivered of the demons. And then when later an even worse vision than that was supposedly Jesus came to her and told her that it was important that she suffer these things uh, to pay for her sins and to make penance And that in doing so, Annalise could help Jesus save many souls. So Jesus was not teaching, this Jesus that she had this vision of, was not teaching her that he once and for all atoned for her sins and that she just needed to repent to him. Oh no, she had to pay for other people's sins, pay for her own sins, on and on and on it went. Completely unbiblical. You won't find one scripture in the Bible of anything like this. But the demon then later laughs at the priest and tells the priest that I'm the one who made her write those things. And the priest still doesn't get it. That's why you don't have this crazy dialogue with demons. The priest was asking questions over and over about different councils in the Catholic church and You know, wanted the demon to affirm constantly that those councils were proper and good and right and all these things. Hey, hey, if you already know they're right, why do you need a demon to tell you they're right? You should have the witness of the Holy Spirit, but it's not there. At one point, the priest is asking the demon for secrets that he can give to the bishops. And he says, quote, in the name of Jesus and in the name of Mary, I command you to tell everything I must communicate to the bishop. He then shortly thereafter asked the demon when it would leave. And the demon said in 20 years, it got to the point where the priest was even asking the demons to Confirmed that angels were real. Now, all of this mindless jibber-jabber and waste of time, precious time, is what ultimately cost Annalise her life. If they had taken the authority 10 months earlier and driven these demons out, Annalise would have had a normal, happy life quite possibly would be alive to this day with a powerful testimony. The problem is they would have had to number one, get saved for real themselves and salvation's not in Mary's name. And if you think I'm making it up that they even said these things that Mary's saving souls, look up the transcripts. They're easy to find online. They did say it. I once was in a Catholic funeral and they had hymnals in the pews and the priest wanted everyone to sing these hymns. So I pick up the hymnal and I look at it and these look just like a Protestant hymnal, except when you start reading the words, the words were things like this, Mary, you are the Holy one. You are our intercessor. And I looked at the person beside me and I said, do not sing that. That's a good way to curse yourself. It's a good way to get possessed. That is not the way you follow Christ, and that is certainly not the way you cast demons out of a person. Now, this whole thing with Mary, a lot of people think, well, it started with Constantine because he started a Catholic religion and and all that, and that's where 
really is kind of recognized as starting. But the reality is it started way before that. And again, I've never heard any preacher ever preach this. This is something that I believe God showed me. And it's so obvious. I can't believe I've never heard any preacher mention this. But I believe this first idea of Mary worship and elevating Mary above Jesus started long before that. If we look in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, it says, And it came to pass, this is speaking of Jesus, it says, And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. In other words, blessed is Mary. And then Jesus said, it says in verse 28, But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So instantly, she's putting all the attention on Mary, saying blessed is, blessed is Mary. And Jesus says, No, blessed are the people who hear the word of God and keep the word of God. He shut that whole Mary worship thing and that elevation of Mary down right there. He nipped it in the bud. But the devil just repackages his lies and keeps bringing them back for more. So, I believe if you really look at the real case of the exorcism of Emily Rose, there is much more to the story than what was portrayed by Hollywood. And I believe when you look at the truth of what really happened, the priests should have been prosecuted. They should have been found guilty, but they should have served longer than six months. And I will bet you this much. I'm not really a betting man, of course, but if there's, st- if these priests are still alive, they need to repent. If they're not, and they did not repent, they're paying right now. And I would bet you that they are being reminded continually of how those demons told them over and over and over. I lie all the time. I constantly lie. And the priest kept talking to them anyway, trying to affirm his religious beliefs. We are not supposed to be doing that. We are not supposed to be conversing with demons like this. It's acceptable to find out who they are, why they're there, and drive them out in the name of Jesus. But beyond that, you're just asking for trouble. So I hope that sheds a little better light on what exorcism really is and what exorcism is not. I hope that kind of gives you a little bit better understanding of how this all works and how true believers really do have that authority in Jesus name. That concludes episode 24, the truth behind the exorcism of Emily Rose. If you like the podcast, remember to subscribe, like, and share. You can check out the stranger than fiction podcast page on Facebook as well. And if you want to support the podcast, you can also uh, go to Amazon and pick up a copy of Nightmare in Holmes County or 225th Street, which tell terrifying true stories of spiritual warfare and paranormal activity in real life haunted houses. Both books are available as Kindle, paperback, or audiobook at Amazon.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and until next time, good night and God bless.